as we, um, as we look at Philippians again today, and we look at Paul's journey, the Apostle Paul, uh, we're going to literally see how he was able to keep a continual frame of reference of who Jesus was, the significance of the cross and the resurrection, a focus on what the meaning of his life was, uh, the things that mattered, the things that really didn't matter as much. And so as we do that, you know, we, we've looked recently, very recently, last time we were together, we look at keeping perspective based on purpose, having a purpose that's really bigger than yourself. And we see in the Apostle Paul, he was, he was dealing with some tough times. Uh, he found himself writing to a church where he had seen tremendous life change take place in their life. In one of his previous uh, journeys to share the gospel, he had uh, come upon a Bible study down by the, the river. These were Jewish folks, and he shared the gospel with them. They accepted Christ. I mean, they're listed by name. They, they were baptized. Uh, ten years later, we find him uh, writing a letter to them and writing that letter to them literally from uh, a, a position of being chained to a guard uh, day by day. We find him in Rome, not knowing what the future would be. He's kind of a political prisoner, if you will, uh, not having a chance yet to share his case uh, of the gospel, literally knowing that the only reason that he was in chains and had made all of this journey and suffered what he had suffered was truly because he loved Jesus and he wanted to share the gospel with all who would hear of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so as he was in that position, I was kind of astonished, frankly, as I looked back through that journey last week with you and looked at his ability to rejoice even in the difficult place, to rejoice even in a, uh, a place of, of really what was suffering uh, in a way that most of us uh, have never, we don't have anything to relate it to and truly uh, probably would not, uh, unless we grow some spiritually, we wouldn't handle it near as well as what he did. And so as we look at where he was and look at what he had walked through, I want us to be encouraged today. And I am, listen, I am hopeful that as we finish this morning, uh, in a few minutes, that you'll walk out the door encouraged. But let me tell you what I desire more than that. What I desire is and pray for is that the very basic calls of Christianity, that, that there is no salvation made possible outside of Jesus Christ, and, and literally the good news of Jesus is that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. Um, this is the basic track that Christians run on, that, that churches are to be about, is the sharing of the gospel, that Jesus saves and we can choose him. As a result, I also want you to know that there is a, a line that is drawn in the sand in believer's baptism. It is a, a public declaration of personal surrender to Christ. Uh, and so those two things are things that we desire for you. Because you've accepted Christ, the next step is believer's baptism. We're seeing that uh, in our local body as, as believers in Jesus. Now, that being said, this is the framework of the group of people that the Apostle Paul was writing to. And he was writing encouraging them, how do you live life? And what, what, what is your frame of reference supposed to be as you uh, make a next step kind of plan relative to living in a world where Jesus is going to return but hasn't returned yet? We do have a home with him in heaven, but it isn't time to go yet. And so how do you do life? I mean, I think it's an incredible question. And so I want you to join me. i got to kind of take a breath someplace. But I want you to join me. Look at Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to go back and, like, literally I'm going to read to you again uh, verse 18 because it gives us a context and a frame of reference. Those that study these things think the, half, the last half of verse 18 is in the context uh, and in the line of thought with this, the, the, the section of Scripture I'm about to read to you. And I just think it's good to kind of put the frame of reference there for you. So here's where we're at, verse 18. Uh, let, let me just simply say he, he rehearsed his struggles. He rehearsed the fact that there were people preaching the gospel for the wrong reasons, some preaching the gospel for the right reasons, but either way, people were preaching the gospel. So should he be discouraged? Should he give up? What should he do? He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. So we finished on a note of rejoicing last week. Then he repeats himself as we start this uh, on rejoicing this week and says, yes, and I will rejoice. For I know, why is he rejoicing? For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, 
whether by life or by death. There was a lot of uncertainty in his life as far as how things would go. For to me, he says, this is one of the most quoted texts in the Bible, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. I'm torn. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. It's true. That's a true statement, right? Heaven's better than the here and now. That's all that the, the, the Scripture tells us is that presence with the Lord, the physical, uh, actual presence with the Lord is way better than this temporary thing that we know. It's hard for us to fathom. Um, but what Paul stated is the truth. He says, I know it would be better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you, with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. You know, these are strong words from the Apostle Paul about how to view life and what really does matter the most. And I hope that as we, as we look through the verses, if I've got to give you a single thread, uh, the single thread is that, that, that I want Jesus to be my heartbeat. I, wanna, I want what, 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 what fuels and caused the Lord to come and to live the life that he lived and to care so much, like unconditionally enough that he would share his, and give his life for us. I want that kind of love to reflect my life. I want, I want to understand, I want for you, uh, for you as well, to, to live life in a way that we value what he values. We've talked about this over the years in a variety of different ways, but to, lit, to say, say to me, for, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain, is to say that the very embodiment of the way that I live my day, the reflection of it, the lens through which I look through every aspect of who I am and what I do, whether it's as a mother or a father or a teenager or a young adult or uh, whatever your phase of life is, all of it should be through the lens of who Jesus is and what the impact is on our life. And so we desire, I desire, I want you to want, like I want, Jesus to be your heartbeat. And I think that's what Paul wanted for this group of folks in Philippi. Now, we should rejoice in all things. That is a very, very much a theme. If I'm giving you a, a point number one, it's just we should rejoice in all things. He starts that way in verse 18. He's going to continue to talk about the rejoicing. Uh, and he finds a way... To, to be thankful and also have joy. All the way through chapter 4 in Philippians, this is a theme of the entire book. That joy is not dependent upon circumstance. And so part of our prayer is that we would see the world the way that the Lord sees the world, that Jesus sees the world, so that we could have the same joy in this instance that Paul had. Another thing that I think is, is fascinating to me, you would think somebody like the Apostle Paul didn't need anybody. Like, if he had Jesus, that would be enough. And technically, God's grace would be sufficient. He says that in the Scriptures. But he makes no mistake about the fact that he wants the prayers of these very, this very group of people that he'd been praying for. He says to them, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And he says, it's my eager expectation and hope that I wouldn't be ashamed. He's going to still face some kind of a trial, doesn't know which way it's going to go. Uh, ends up being released. He felt like he was going to be released, but he, and, and he was, but still... Whether he remain or not remain, nobody really knew. And he says, I believe that your prayers plus the strengthening power of the Holy Spirit together are going to make a difference in that. The Apostle Paul found strength in the prayers of others on his behalf. Is that, is, is that news to anybody? Like for some of you, it's probably a shock. You think people that are, that are strong people of faith don't need anybody to pray for them. I'm telling you that Paul says, pray for me. He, in other places, says, pray for me that I'd be bold and courageous. You remember that? Uh, pray for me as an ambassador in chains. I want you to know that still matters that we pray for one another. Even if we're talking uh, with or looking towards someone that we respect, someone that we love, someone that leads, their, our prayers for them matters according to the Scripture. It just does. And so I want to just tell you, thank you for, I'm not Apostle Paul. I need way more prayers than he did, right? So, so I'm thankful for, for, for those of you that pray for me. He also says that the power of the Holy Spirit will enable you. Like, or enable him. He says, I, I'm confident that your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ will turn out for my deliverance. He didn't know what the turnout would be, but he just knew God was in charge. He just knew that God's people were praying on his behalf. He'd been, he'd been released from prison before, you know. There was a whole uh, prison cell that swung open. One of those early first church in Philippi kind of guys. I mean, if you go back and look at the history, we looked at this several weeks ago. Um, it, you know, they sang all night in the prison while they were captured. The people were, were praying Prison door swings open, he was released. These kind of things did happen at times. And so he was confident that in whatever way God saw fit, 
God would bring about the ending that God saw fit to bring about. Deliverance would occur. And he says, it's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. You know what he's not placing his confidence in? He's not placing his confidence in things that are outside of the scope of what like God would be about. Like, like w- would it be reasonable? I, 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 well, let me just say this. Do, do you live every day with an, and this is not meant to be cynical, it's just real. If you have to live every day with an eager hope and anticipation that D.C. is going to get all better tomorrow, <laughs> that's not a well-placed hope. I mean, I mean, I'm not knocking leaders. We should pray for all of our leaders. I mean, we really should. But I'm being sincere with you. When Paul says, it is my eager hope and expectation, I want you to know who he's hoping in. He's not hoping in people. He's not, I mean, he, he's hopeful in the prayers of, of the folks, and, but, he's, but he's confident. His eager expectation, like eager expectation, nobody can say that about what I just described in D.C. Or even just from people in general. Like there are people in your life that you, you, would be, you wouldn't be wise. I mean, you should pray for them, but you would not be wise to expect humanly out of them something that's you, you just, it, it's, it's not reasonable. And yet, when we talk about our Jesus, I want you to have confidence in the, in, in the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus of the Word. When I, when I look at and I, I know I'm kind of giving parents a charge. When I, if I'm talking to you about what the kids need, the kids need a foundation. They need, they need to know that Jesus is worthy of our eager expectation and hope. They need to know that we don't have to fear because we can trust him. I'll be uh, vague but real. In our congregation, crazy weather, one of our children, going through our children's ministry, I'm proud of this, made the statement to an adult, Hey, you don't have to be scared about the weather. What? Get your Bible, Grandma. Get your Bible. I'm going to show you. God said we don't have to be scared when the bad weather comes. And they proceeded to get the Bible and open the Bible. God said you don't have to fear. Let that anxiety go out the door. I mean, this is what it's about. This is the foundation we're talking about. I mean, Psalm 56.3 might be one of those. When I'm afraid, Lord, I will trust in you. I mean, you memorize it. You put it in your head and heart. And then when people say, you better be scared, you're like, I'm not sure if I should be scared. The Bible says don't fear. It says that, that, that God is with me, that he walks in front of me and behind me. And it says he carries a big stick. It actually says his rod and his staff, they comfort me in Psalm 23. But it means a big stick. I mean, that's what it means. Brandon, you get it, right? I mean, just you, you know, we're bands of it's, it's a big stick. And so I don't have to be scared because daddy's got me. It's going to be all right. Eager expectation and hope. That the prayers of God's people and the strengthening of the Holy Spirit would allow him to be delivered. He literally is going to say, it's my prayer that I would honor Jesus in life or in death. I just, I want to finish this honoring God. He literally says uh, in verse 20, Christ will be honored. I w-, he says, because of this, I have full courage. I looked that up, see what that meant. It just meant sufficient courage. Lord, give me, in fact, I have all the courage that I need to take the next step that I need to take and honor you, whether in life or in death. I will not be ashamed of who you are. I'm not going to step back because I have an eager expectation and hope that you will deliver, and I trust you with whatever the end game and result of that is. He goes on to say, after saying, I want to be, Christ will be honored. I have full courage now as always. Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. He says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Something that I, if I knew it, I forgot it. Uh, I guess I've gotten far enough along in life now and maybe far enough out of seminary. There's, I, I didn't study everything all the time, and I read everything more than once, and we studied some things. But I did not know that this text was based on Job thirteen fifteen, where in the old school translation it says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Proverbs 13, 15, and 16 in, a, in, in the same English translation, English standard version here says, though he slay me, I will hope. Remember we were talking about eager hope and anticipation. I will hope in him. Yet I will argue my ways to his face. This will be my salvation that the godless shall not come before him. Now that's an Old Testament look. And Paul's looking at it from the New Testament, but literally many of the commentators believe that by this time Paul had him a copy of a Greek Old Testament, like they had begun to take these scrolls and put them in a, in a, in a, in a, in a Greek format, and he literally, this, this is a translation of that. Isn't it kind of cool that by virtue it's so similar to Job 13, 
We, we ha- I mean, the thoughts are not just there. Like it's the, the, the wording is, is there. That means Paul, in his prison cell, in his eager hope and expectation, anticipating that God would deliver him. Do you know what thought he had? He thought, man, remember Job? Here's a man that loved God and he thought about Job. You don't have to raise your hand, but some of y'all thought about Job in recent years. You've thought about your life. You've thought about your circumstances. You've thought about a diagnosis and relationship and a series of happenings. It didn't seem fair. It seems like you were trying to do the right thing and bad things happened anyway, and you don't have answers for any of that. Listen to me. The apostle Paul had the same thought. The Apostle Paul thought it through, and he says, I trust God to deliver me even if I don't understand it, even if I don't have the answers right now, which also, which additionally, I think it's outstanding. Like, I, I'm not sure the right word to use to describe this, but the idea that the Apostle Paul, in similar circumstances, similar context as Job, Job was in a difficult space, not of his own making, because he was honoring God. Literally, that's why Heaven allowed the the, the hedge of protection to be brought down around him was to demonstrate the faith of Job, but not because he'd ever done anything wrong. The Apostle Paul, you you see in this, he sat, I'm getting inside of his mind, but this this makes tons of sense. He's sitting in this cell, or his house arrest place, chained up to said guy. I mean, I don't care how nice and cushy the bed was. Chained to to another man all day, every day, that is is prison. Uh, I mean, some of y'all couldn't handle actually just the COVID uh, being isolated from people. Imagine having a grown man hooked up to you that just wasn't very nice. I mean, I don't think they've ever, I've ever heard of a Roman soldier that was a nice guy. I mean, we had some that got saved and became that, I guess. Um, so here he sits, and he's reflecting on, all I've ever done is preach the gospel. This whole praetorian guard, remember in the last text, it says the, because of what God had allowed him to deal with, his perspective was based on the purpose God was working out. He looked at what had happened because of all these things he'd experienced. He said, you know what? I've been through this, this shipwreck and all these beatings and everything that's gone along, but this prison sentence that I've gotten is putting me in front of all the Roman officials. We even see towards the, well, it's Philippians chapter 4, that the apostle Paul is able to say there are people in Caesar's household, probably Nero's houses who were describing, that actually came to a saving knowledge of Christ. Because I was imprisoned. So he's looking at his life through the purposes of God, but still as he looked through all that, Paul is having to answer the question, what did I do to deserve it, though? Like, isn't there a different way this could happen? And he says, though he slay me, for me to live is Christ, and for me to die is gain. Oh, if we as Christians had a similar view. It's not natural to think like that. It's not. It's natural if you're in a younger, I think it's natural, it's how I used to think, in the younger phase of life, you, I mean, and, 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 I, and again, I'm picking at somebody, but some of y'all, you, I'm not picking, I'm acknowledging that I know kind of what the journey is. You get in your, in your teenage years, you look forward to the day that you oh, can get out from under mom and dad's house. I mean, I love my parents, but I, you, you want your independence. That's normal. You, I hope you want your independence. Nobody wants you staying at home when you're, you know, 56 and, um, you know, still at mom and dad's. I mean, that's not the plan. And so God inbuilt in you a desire for independence. That'd be normal, right? And you, so you want this, Lord, I had not even lived my life yet. Don't come back yet. Give me, give me some time to live some life, right? Give me, give me the opportunity to, to be able to, to meet someone and to get married and to, uh, to have a family. I mean, like, well, I mean, I want Jesus to return, but not sure I want him to return today. I mean, I used to think that way. Now I'm like, any day now would be really good, you know? <laughs> I mean, can we go in groups? Because i got a little responsibility, and there's a few people I'd want to go with me, but I'm not, listen, I'm not Jim Jones talking about anything crazy here. Like, that's not even godly or whatever. I'm just talking about Jesus on the day that he comes, and when it's time, I recognize enough of where life is that any time now would be great. Like, we'd be better off that way. And the Apostle Paul is acknowledging that. That's, listen, this is pure gospel thinking It's what it is. It's not pure fleshly thinking like we don't think like that. We're like, okay, well, he just attached. I can't, I can't really relate to that. But that's, part of the, like, that's part of the issue for us. Like as Christians, if we want his heartbeat, we have to see the world the way he sees it. Because he authored it and created it and created us. And created us unique for the things that we're to be about. And so here's Paul with this, and, and maybe this is the challenge for some of you today, is Lord, help me see my, my life as you see my life. Help me to so trust you that when you said you went away to prepare a place, 
And if it weren't so, you would, that, that it's going to be a good place. Help me to trust you that when you sent your son who died and rose, that's Easter, right? That's the Easter story, the resurrection for Jesus. If you did all that so that I could be with you in that place forever, number one, your presence is enough, but number two, whatever it is you got prepared, I want some of that. Like, like I don't get all of it, but I don't need to be the interior decorator on it. I don't need to be the planning committee on it. I don't need to be in charge of it. Like, I'm in charge of enough stuff. I'd just be saying, Lord, just whenever you're ready, I'm going to go with you. I mean, are there those people in your life? I mean, there's some, that, 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 we're being real. Can we be honest just here for a second? Like, and I wouldn't point any of you out as people that I wouldn't want to, like, go there with. But there's some people, they invite you over for them, you know what's coming. And, or, and you don't really know, you just know it's going to be really good, right? And so you're like, hey, whatever you're serving, I'm eating. I mean, you just, you just invite me over. Or they say, hey, you want to go fishing? You're like, oh, I want to go with you because I know you're going to catch him. Or they say, hey, you want to go hunting, man? You just tell me where to sit. You tell me which direction to look. And you tell me what time that big old antler thing is going to come along, and I will be there. Because you just know from reputation, like, they know the stuff. Then there's other folks who are like, yeah, I think I'm busy that day. Now, listen, if I'm not available, it doesn't mean I think that of you, okay? I mean, can I just say that? Like, I'm walking out on a limb this way. But when we're talking about eager anticipation, like how we view God, do you really, do you, like, you know God's, he's the one that's like the best of the best at everything. Like, if there is a spiritual giftedness, he was the one that created the person and the gift and knows it at its perfection and can apply it all. So hospitality, he knows, right? The idea of unconditional love, he's got it. That's why you get a chance to go there with Jesus like if you, if you receive him. And so when we look at life after, kind of crazy talking that way, but when you look at what's next, the call of script, like when we're looking like, man, when I'm re if I read the newspaper, not a particular news, just in general, when I read the news, if I'm having to view like, okay, well, how do I view things from that? That's not what God's created us for. He's driving us to the word so that we can be joy-filled in spite of circumstance. And when we go here, what do we find? Like, I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you to keep digging, keep studying, see what you find. Because when I look through Philippians, we're not going to get outside of a space where he doesn't say to us, hey, all of, like, this is the literal wording, all the rest of life is rubbish in comparison to Jesus. All the other things we think we value, they're really not that valuable. And it's hard for us to, pro like, it really is hard for us to process that. I mean, we're, we're going to walk in a few months, and it's going to be great because we'll have this, this time to recognize some, um, the accomplishments of, of, of seniors, but more importantly, a spiritual moment that they have, have, have gotten to this place and launched them into life. But listen, as parents, it's not, it's not just about getting them to that place because some of you are already you're starting to weep and stuff. Like, I know you. It's, 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 the, it's the, we got one that already graduated. It's the thing, right? And some of you sitting here, you got, you got grown kids, and they got kids, and so you're looking at it, and you're like, Oh, yeah, but the grandparent thing is kind of cool, you know. I mean, I'm looking forward to that. The point is this. We look at these things as though they are markers that we must be able to accomplish. And if you get the opportunity, they're not bad. In fact, some of those very things, I, th I, think, I think that probably holding a grandchild and seeing a creation that came from a creation that God made through you, and then it, it, I think that's got some part of heaven in it. I don't know exactly all of how that looks, but that's God's doing. And there you go. And there's some other stuff in our world that's that way. I tend to think, I'm just getting all gooey a little bit, but I tend to think that the night sky on a new moon with the stars bright, not where there's a bunch of light, just sitting in the lake looking up, waiting for sun to come. That, that's beautiful. Because I just think it's a picture of heaven. I think the sunset on a clear day on our beach, that is a picture of heaven. And then there's some stuff that's just messed up. If we value the world the way that Paul values the world. More importantly, we look at it the way that he did. He looked at his role as one in which he might have a preference because he understands enough. Man, he got special teaching that we didn't get. That's another talk for another time. But he understood that heaven was going to be a special place. But in this text, he says, hey, guys, I know that I'm st I've still got stuff left to do. And while I'm torn... And I'm pressed between the two. And if I had to pick, I'd probably say, man, let's just get us a bunch up to go. You're like, whoa, I ain't getting on that bus. Hang with me. He says, but let me just tell you what I think is true. I believe God's got stuff yet to be done. And this is the part that I think is so incredible. Because when we talk about the heartbeat of Jesus, what Paul had left to do were things that he believed God had created him for. You talk about purpose. 
Like, this is a big, a big picture point that if we don't get this right, then we just are going about selfish live, do, lives, doing them in a, a, a so-so righteous way, but not doing the, the holy thing that God desired to build us for. And so when you look at the text, okay, where's that in the text? Let me show you. He says, I'm hard-pressed, I'm a, but, but he says, I'm a, to, to know whether I should depart and be with Christ, I know it's far better, verse 24, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Man, I'm ready to go, but guess what? It seems pretty obvious to me that God's not done yet. And he tells this church when he writes them, it's a cool letter, he writes them the letter and he says, guys, I still think God wants you to take some steps forward and I'm part of what's, like, God put me here to help you do that. And so as we progress, he's literally using the word, my, my prayer for you is that I'm here for your progress I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. I want to see joy. You, you have the joy and the faith that, that he has. And he says, I want to see you cut a, literally cut a path forward for the gospel. He's saying he wants them to continue to press on toward the upward call and the prize of Christ. And he believes God's got a part of that for him. Here's what's crazy. This connects with all the rest of Scripture. There are those moments where we, when we, when we see a thing, we're like, okay, well, I, somehow I miss all that. This seems like an extra teaching and not like the normal mainstream teaching. Let me, let me show you something that's, that, that's really neat. And I, it looks like I just kind of have got excited and went right past it. It's hard to think I'd get excited and go past it. You know, there are certain places in the Bible that we take the obvious, and over years of time we emphasize things and, 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 and on a given day, there ought to be things, I think, that hit us in a certain way. We say, you know, that's one of my favorite ever. Well, over time, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain is one of the most quoted texts that there is. I've shared that, and you know that. If you look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you find two verses that talk about the grace that we have in Christ, that we once were a wretch and we've been saved, and it's not by our works. And so we, we know that, but we miss verse 10. And verse 10 says very clearly that he created us as, as Christ's workmanship. He created us in Christ Jesus, and it says that we are his workmanship and that there are things that he's prepared in advance for us to do. We catch the grace. We, we miss the fact that because we're saved, there's things that are on our list to be about. Paul wrote those words, inspired by God, which very much reflect Philippians chapter 1, where he says, I think God has me here because i got some more things on my list. And you're on the list. We, we tend to miss in the Great Commission where it says, go make disciples of all nations. And we talk about uh, that moment where our kids accept Christ and then they're baptized, uh, grown adults being baptized. It's the, the surrender moment. Accept Christ, they're baptized, but we miss the rest of the verse. We miss the rest of the commission. Like, because this happens, what now? Jesus literally told us in the gospel. He said, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. We miss that other part. So what comes after, and I think we've done this with this verse, what comes in verse 22? For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, verse 22. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. So until he takes me, I'm supposed to bear fruit. Until he takes you, until it's over, until your days are done, there's things that you're to be about. Which means you don't get to sit in sorrow and, 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 and anxiety and, and all these things and not do the things on the list. God's created you and you, he's built you for, for some things. And some of those things you know and I don't. Some of those things you're like, I'm too young to know that. I didn't figure that out. I don't even know what I'm going to do in college. It's going to take a bit for some of it. Like, I was a little bit along my journey before I kind of figured out all the stuff that was supposed to happen next. You're not going, I mean, anybody that's lived a little bit can just tell you you're not going to have it all figured out in a day. You're taking the very next step by faith with the, the, the clarity that you've been given today. But hear what I'm saying to you. If you're here and you're upright and taking nourishment, you're to be fruitful and labor for the Lord. You're like, no, 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 no. You're one of those preachers. I'm just a person. You don't find that, like, I am an equipper of people for ministry. That's Ephesians 4. Like, this is what we're told that people like me are supposed to do. I'm gifted, I'm called, I'm, you gathered up, we're reading the word, and I'm sending you out to go do it. Like, we're practicing up, we're going to do more of it. You're like, what? wait, what? Like, that means that like, you actually think I'm supposed to help you with gospel ministry. Yep. I said that a little loud. Um, I actually do. 
I think that it's your job, and I think that, that I'm going to encourage, but I think that you're supposed to share the gospel. You're supposed to shine a bright light in Bay County. I think I can't do it by myself. I think that you're supposed to be seeing people come, be, become saved. The greatest soul winner in any home is the mom and dad. you got way more opportunity than I'll ever have. And that's not to put pressure on you. You say, well, I didn't have one of those. It's all right. We're going to partner with you, and we're going to encourage, but I'm not taking anything different than the path the Word teaches, which says it matters that we engage. And so you want to know what's on your list? Boy, it's getting real now. If he gave you one, you got, you got another one coming. What's the name again? Baylor. Baylor. All right. So, so he chose y'all for Baylor. I mean, you, you're, you're Baylor's first evangelist. I mean, even it, it, it's, it's, it's the fact. Like, this is how we're created. What's on your list? Loving your family. Loving them in Jesus' name as he would because he's given you to them. You say, well, things are kind of messed up. We'll figure out what it means to love them in Jesus' name. Starting from where you're at. Talk through it, pray through it, and do it. I have families tell me sometimes, and I do not mean this in a condemnatory sort of way, like it's with the greatest amount of love. And I don't always respond like I don't, you don't want to just kind of come over the top. People say sometimes things that just aren't really smart, and they don't know that it's not smart, and they're nervous enough around plain old me uh, anyway, and so you, don't, you just want to be careful. But sometimes people say to me, I don't want to force Jesus on my kids. Can I just tell you, you can't force Jesus on your kids. Now, you could, you, could, you could be dogmatic and legalistic in some ways that probably would be a bad example for them and them not wanting to choose Jesus, but if you reflect the heart of Jesus, if you beat the heart of Jesus, they're going to want Jesus. And what I can promise you is there's nothing else in your life that is of way less value that you'd ever do that with. I mean, you, you, the fact that you're here means volumes about where you stand. I mean, God loves everybody, the ones that aren't in church, the ones that aren't watching, the, the ones that aren't concerned about their spiritual welfare, welfare today. But if you're here and you've got kids here, and surely if you dedicated your child today, you want your kids to know Jesus. Well, I'm just going to tell you, you don't just haphazardly determine whether or not your kids are going to get educated. You take them to school every day. You get them what they need to do it. You make sure they said, I don't want to go to school today. You know, I don't care if you don't want to go to school today. You're going to school today. Now, they used to throw you in jail if your kids didn't go to school. Now, that ain't really the case. Probably ought to be, but that's a whole other story for a different day. I don't have eager expectation. Let me just say and hope on that one. But, but here's the point. With athletics, I mean, I like to fish. You ain't going to accidentally learn how to do all that. I mean, we, we're like, hey, I'm going to have an outdoorsman. I mean, I'm guessing y'all already, you know, some of y'all already bought the, the stuff. I mean, you got the first boots and the first bow and the first, uh, you, you, hear, <laughs> hear what I'm saying. It's about time. If we really believe Jesus is the Son of God and died on the cross and we really believe that eternity is at stake, it's about time that we do everything that we can to model for our kids who Jesus is, knowing that the model we set is far greater than any lesson that we teach. And no matter where you started and where you find yourself right now, the, the, the possibility of you taking a, a moment here and stepping forward into what God desires for you as that influential parent, grace can cover an awful lot, but you've got to acknowledge he's called you to this. Your kids are on your list. And I'm just going to tell you, I think grandparents are on the list. Some of you just feel gutted right now because the relationship may not be what it can. I can't make that, like, I can't make that happen. And I'm not, I'm not trying to, to create guilt in that. I'm telling grandparents that have that access, that you have relationship with, this is on your list. They need, I mean, I don't, I don't know that these, these kiddos are yet ready to understand a fate story. Teenagers need to hear fate stories of grandparents. They need to know where they came from, how God's been faithful, how they've trusted in him all along the way, how he has, has, has forgiven them when they goofed up, messed up, and they've seen that when they didn't do it God's way, it was a mess, and when they did do it God's way, God blessed it. And that they, the word is worthy, and that it's right. And with parents and grandparents, honestly, even teachers, there are times that you mess up. You're like, hey, that doesn't reflect my Jesus. I, de I, I declared my Jesus. You know I declare my Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name. I try to get it right. What you just heard me say, I was mad. It was in the flesh. You got to know that doesn't reflect the heart of Jesus. That's me failing in that moment, and I'm asking your forgiveness. Like, that is not a weak thing. That is a model that our kids and our world needs to see and hear. Hear me say this, though. Like, well beyond just the parenting thing, how we do recreation, how we do just the interest in life, our careers. If you're a carpenter, you should be a carpenter for Jesus. If you're a school teacher, Jesus is the framework. If you're a, a leader in our community, Jesus is the framework. 
Like the hope would be, Lord, help my heart beat like your heart beats so that I see the world the way you see it. Now, there's fruitful labor. I found out, I found out this week, I've had an issue with um, some plants that I planted. They're called podocarpuses. I love them. I don't think that's how you say it. I don't know if that's how you say it plurally or not. Podocarpi. No, it's podocarpuses. I have more than one podocarpus plant. They're bushy things. They told me they grow tall, and I'm like, tall is good. I've lost all the bushes at the house, and I just don't like people turning the corner, and then psh, they just, there I am. I don't like that. Uh, it, it, anybody else feel that way? Like naked without trees? So I've been working on making these things grow tall and fast. Well, now they're growing really tall and really green, and they're starting to fall over. And so I asked, I asked my friend Ken that helped me with them. I, he had to get me a couple more because I killed a couple of them, too. I'm not great with plants. Uh, it's not my spiritual gift. And, 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 and so I said, what am I doing wrong? He said, you got to cut them. So I cut them. He said, they're growing too fast. I said, no, 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 they're supposed to grow tall. He said, yeah, they're going to grow tall, but the more you cut them, the more they'll grow. I said, well, now I know what the problem is. i got to cut them more. And some of y'all been, I'm in the group, y'all been getting cut on a lot. I mean, you've been getting pruned. And remember, Jesus prunes the dead wood because it's in the way. I mean, that's what you do with a lot of things. You're like, okay, that was not a productive plant. But then you got others. This one was fruity. It did really good. So what do they do? Whack. Well, why did you do that? And though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Because he wants you to be more fruitful. Because he's got fruitful labor. Hear me say this to you. Jesus loves you so much. But it's going to continue to be probably the struggle's real. And Paul never stopped really living the struggle. But when we look at our struggle, we don't need to say, God, because I'm struggling, you can't be real. No. We don't have an example where that wasn't the case. What we should be looking at with Paul's eyes, Lord, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And it is my hope, Paul says, it's my hope that when it's done, that you'll think the apostle Paul's a great, no, no, no. He says, it is my hope that they will have ample cause in me. You may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. He says to this group of people, because I came to you again. Whenever we're dead and gone, and one day that's likely to happen, the question ought to be, what do people think of Jesus because you were there? It's not where your name is. It's not the bucket list of things that you got that you want to do or the markers and the milestones. It really, as Christians, is supposed to be about Jesus. I kind of end on a real positive note. Not that that wasn't positive. I hadn't said much. I tried real hard. Most I've come, closest I've come to say anything in the service was what I said in my prayer at the beginning. I've seen life change in our community. I've seen it over the last several years. I've seen a unity with, unity with leadership and businesses I've never seen before relative to have a community that reflects the heart of God. You say, well, they don't all feel that way. No, they don't. But you know what? In our community, there's a god fear and presence and will that it's going to be different moving forward. That's not changed, and that is different than a few years back. It's flat different. I think it's great. I think it's incredible. I'm going to point Brandon out one more time, and here's why. Brandon's helping with our men's ministry. I've got, I mentioned this Wednesday, I've got men there. Last year, they got in a group that meets, and uh, they were getting ready to meet in about an hour, and I'm talking about the small group, not the men's dinner. And one of those old boys, I think it was Ricky, he, uh, he met me up. He said, man, I got to go. I said, what do you mean you got to go? He said, I got men's, men's group tonight. And he said, I gotta, I'm going to leave the fish, and I'm not going to see the sunset. He left the preacher sitting on the water to go to the men's group at the church. I'm seeing life change. I'm seeing these guys step up and lead and do stuff. I'm seeing guys saying, you know what, I'm coming out of, I'm, I'm not saying you can't hunt, you can't, I'm just saying there's a, there's a priority difference with some of that stuff. And when life change happens, you start seeing people rise up. And I could give you a number of examples, any old accident, Mr. Chester, I, I just, I, I want you to know your boy's making a difference. And there's stuff happening in his life. And there's other men in here, I'm seeing life change, I ain't going to point all you out and call all of you by name. There's some things left on the list. And I'm excited because you're doing what's on the list. And some of you are doing it real well. Praise God for it. We're going to, listen, here's how we're going to close. I got lots of favorite songs these days. This one is Praise the Name of the Lord Our God. It's about Him. It's not about me. It's not about anybody else in this community. 
not even about Apostle Paul. It's about glorifying the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, that when we get done, we would have done the thing. When he takes us to be that place, it's better. In the here and now, Lord, help me to do the thing that will glorify you and glorify the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this people that I get to do life with, that I get to lead and love and encourage in Jesus' name. And I pray, Father, that you would take uh, not just these moments as we praise you, not just this special time we've had today to talk about, well, to talk about what it looks like to live a life for the gospel, to live a life with the purpose that you had in mind for us in the Bible. Lord, I pray that we would spend our time and our talents and our energy, that our focus would be on the things that matter most to you, that our heartbeat would be the gospel, that we would be able to say, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. And if I am to live, I will live a fruitful life in labor as a servant, not for what I can do for me, but for how I can invest in others and see fruit from it like Paul with the Philippians. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray your blessing as we praise your name. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.